Polski in southeastern Poland was built on a grandiose plan. It was supposed to be bigger than the nearby Rzeszów and was to become a major trading center. You can still see it by the size of its enormous market square. But later history wanted it to remain small. It became home to Jewish community. From 1600s there was a synagogue and in 1712 the Jewish cemetery was established on the outskirts. You can see those two very clearly on the Austro-Hungarian cadastral map from mid-1800s. Yes, by 1800s Gogov Małopolski is becoming proudly part of Galicia. So it's directly administered from the Galician capital in Lvov and indirectly from Vienna. We are right now taking a look over the southern districts of the city, which uh, became the Jewish district. The Austro-Hungarian Empire was the time period in which the population of those territories grew rapidly. By the year of 1880, the Jewish population of Gwogów was already 1,200 people, and they were making a little bit over 40% of the total population. And right now, close from the market, we are taking a quick look over the old Jewish cemetery. So we are about to enter the Jewish cemetery in Głogów Małopolski. A city roughly 10 miles north of Rzeszów. A city established in 1570. It was supposed to be a certain counterbalance for the large medieval city of Rzeszów never became, it remained more of an addition to the city of Zeshu. But uh, of course from the very beginning of the city establishment there were also Jews coming because it was modeled as a new renaissance city. It was being given the Magdeburg law as location law and uh, the first documents uh, showing us Jewish community traces are already from 1600s. Looking at the taxation records of 1600s, we know that in the year of 1673 there were 21 Jews in the city paying their taxes to the Crown administration. The cemetery we are at, or rather what is left of it, was established in 1712. Desecration of this space, of course, happened during World War II already under the German Nazis, for whom and liquidation and elimination of any traces of Jewish presence in those lands was uh, also a goal realized scrupulously. But the war finished in 1945. Unfortunately, the disappearance of this site did not. So it was vandalized, the stones were being taken away, used for all kinds of other purposes in the misery of the early communist economy. Today the result is there are no stones visible. Most likely if we carry georada work or some kind of limited excavations under rabbinical supervision would get across and come across the stones. But as for now, it's not visible. In the 1960s, under the communist administration, the site was nationalized and the entire space of this close to 400 years old cemetery was changed into a small city park. Clearly, see the 
asphalt covered paths which were made into a city park. After 1990 and Poland regaining its independence, it came in a package of regaining also a certain consciousness about Polish history and a certain control of Polish history. This consciousness of Polish history was both very cheerful as certain events of Polish history that were very strongly tabooized under the communism could be brought back but also very painful because certain elements of common Polish Jewish, Polish Gypsy, Polish other nationalities which inhabited those lands were inseparably coming to the surface. In the late 90s, under the bill of the Polish parliament, the Jewish communal property, so the property belonging to Jewish communities before the war, property which was made in synagogues, cemeteries, Beit Hamidrashes, mikvahs, was to be brought back into the hands of the nowadays Jewish communities. Uh, this space we are in was brought back into a foundation of preservation of Jewish heritage, which also has a status, status of Jewish community. And uh, in 2012, they've entered into a joint project, mostly sponsored by the Jewish families that originate from Glogov but live in Israel, the United States. They've managed to claim and own this land, taking responsibility for how it looks. So it's been right now upcapped by the gardener. The fences have been upcapped. This work in 2012-2013 also converted the bike stand because this space which used to be an awful and a burial place of the Rubin rabbis that were making a dynasty of rabbis from Gorgov was changed in 1960s into a bike stand for those using the park so during the renovation there was a limited excavation under rabbinical supervision carried. There were traces of the original stones of the Rubin family rabbis uncovered and based on that this new Ohel was built in order to mark and secure the site of their burial. We are talking here of the Rubin dynasty. So this is the site of burial of Rabbi Menachem Mendel Rubin, who lived 1806-1873. His son, Rabbi Yaakov Yosef Rubin, who is, was buried here in 1915 and then his son Rabbi Menachem Mendel Rubin who was the victim of the Holocaust the German Nazis murdered him on the 28th of April 1942 19th-century progress in development of science and medicine brought the decision about gradual closing down of the cemeteries in the city center and removal, constructing new cemeteries in the outskirts of the cities. Such was the case in Gorkov. About a couple of miles from the city center to the east, 
There was a new Jewish cemetery established, which you can clearly see on this military map from late 1930s. We are right now taking a view of this plot of land, which took some time to be mapped. There's obviously a Jewish preburial house still standing, but almost nothing left from the cemetery itself. We are right now in a very eastern edge of the city of uh, Gogów Małopolski, some four kilometers from the market square of the city, somewhere where the Partizantov Street is changing into Busakov Street. According to the Polish military maps of the 30s, the site, which is right now being shown, was the new Jewish cemetery in Gogów Małopolski. This building in behind the trees seems to be a structure erected somewhere in the beginning of 20th century. It might have been a Tahara house. Tahara house. Um, but when you compare and contrast the maps from before World War II and the nowadays maps, this is precisely the site. We know that it was an additional cemetery which was uh, established somewhere in the beginning of 20th century. We know that there might have been about 120 people buried here, 120 glog of Jews buried here, out of a total number of a bit of a thousand Jewish inhabitants of a city before the war. Uh, so we are now back to the city center and from above the old Jewish cemetery there is a very short path on which we will be traveling towards the market square. Exactly midway, in between the old Jewish cemetery on one end of Trinkivica Street and the market square, there is a plot of land where the Gwogov Synagogue has been. We know that this building has been here already in 1600s. This is how it is looking like a drawing. Right now it's replaced with this kind of commonest looking little pavilion of a chimney. And off to the market square. We are standing in Sienkiewicza Street in Głów Małopolski. At the end of the street where the trees are, this is the location of the old 1712 Jewish cemetery. Just a few steps from there down Sienkiewicza Street towards the market is the plot of land with a suspicious communist looking building which still is being used as a kind of a social support and a couple of smaller private businesses. This is the plot of land where the Gorgov Synagogue used to be located. The synagogue was destroyed during the war by the German Nazis and taken apart to be later on, most likely in the 60s, constructed over with this agricultural social help building, as it was called. It's a little tribute to the fact that it used to be a synagogue for those who really know this little piece of street is still being called, and officially named, the Berka Yoselevica Street. And from here, in just a few seconds, we can make it to the market. One thing is sure, when the city was located by Krzysztof Głowa in the prime time of Polish Renaissance, in the year of 1570, and yes, Krzysztof Głowa had a plan. The plan was to make the city of Głogów an outstanding example of Renaissance in Poland. One thing is sure, this man had a very big plan. Uh, he had man. a real plan so that his city is counterbalancing the nearby city of Rzeszów. How do we know it? Well, the size of the market. The size of the market is enormous. It's about 150 meters by 150 meters and uh, yes, in city planning in the medieval and later renaissance time period the size of a market was to reflect the potential economical enterprise that is being planned. Here the market square is of tremendous capacity. Uh, because of certain twists in history, and most likely also its location, of course the city of Gorgov never managed to overshadow the city of Rzeszów. Rzeszów remained sitting very comfortably in the main transportation and merchandising trail connecting Krakow with Lwów. And uh, 
the city of Gorgov remained just an addition, an additional city on the way from Rzeszów towards Kolbuszowa and Sandomierz. Also the city hall, the town hall in the city is a very interesting structure with a tower dominating over the area. The city is owned uh, privately, so in the private cities uh, the Jewish residence was not uh, over-regulated as it was in the church cities for example. And uh, the Jews and other merchants like Armenians were always understood by the families as a critically important economical factor for the city growth, particularly after wars, destructions of fires, there would be incentives made in order to have the Jewish community returning and reinvesting. Uh, the city goes from the hands of uh, Krzysztof Gowa into the Ligenza family shortly and then the Lubomirskis. The Lubomirskis have built a palace here in 1700s. Well, obviously we are traveling here in the day and age of coronavirus, so you can see the city hall has regular announcements about it for those who have not realized yet in the last 16 months that there is something happening. So, in 1700s those were the Lubomirskis. Uh, Lubomirskis built a nice uh, residence outside the city, a palace. This palace unfortunately did not survive World War I. It was torched by the Cossacks, then partly rebuilt and then hit by the bomb in World War II. There was still one wing of the palace remaining. We're actually right now heading towards the Slubomirsky palace. There was one wing of the palace remaining, but uh, the misery of communist economy did away with it very fast. The two buildings which are sitting here proudly are also important witnesses of time. We are right now looking at the building of the Austria-Hungarian district court. Definitely the largest of the buildings in Gorgov is the building of school. Generally schooling in such places is an interesting history of a kind of organic growth starting from early 1800s. It's a building that was accomplished in 1920s, exactly in 1928 it was unveiled in Gorgov a school to which also the Jewish kids from Jewish, a little bit more assimilated families would go. In the gradual phases of liquidation of Jewish existence and Jewish presence in Glogov, this building also plays a role. In late of 1941 the German Nazis are converting this building into a labor camp of 100 Jews from Gorgov and nearby towns. Those who can no longer work are most likely taken to the nearby Gorgov forest, which was known already starting from 1941 as the mass execution place in this part of the country. We know that this little labor camp outlived the Jewish community itself because in spring of 1942 the Germans are ordering establishment of a ghetto in Gorgov. There's a regular ghetto police and all kinds of ghetto structures enacted. But already in summer of 1942 all of the inhabitants of the ghetto, which was a couple of thousands of people, are brutally transported to the central ghetto in Rzeszów, about five miles south of here. And from the ghetto in Rzeszów, in late summer and autumn of 1942, the Jewish community of Gorgov is deported to the death camp of Beuzhet. 
thousands, for tens of thousands of Jews of Jeshiv in its vicinity, this very place of a rail station from which the trains were leaving and deporting them in summer 1942 towards the death camp of Belzhets, this place became a final station in the centuries of Jewish life in this part of southern Poland, later Galicia.